facility and also a special welcome to all the Canterbury Woods residents that are here and to Raymond who is a Canterbury Woods resident and who arranged the program for us. I'm the new president of ANAP, the Alliance of Monterey Area Preservationists. Um, my name is Mimi Sheridan and I'm a historic preservation consultant and architectural historian. So I've been a member for about three years and they made me president. So, um, <laughs> We have a series of talks every year. This is our first one in 2020. We'll have two or three more. Our next meeting, which we would really like you to come to, will be our big annual meeting on March 29th here in this room. And we're honoring a group of people from Salinas who worked very hard to save their architectural heritage. And our guest speaker will be Andre Chavez, the grandson of Cesar Chavez. The um, thing that they really did, this group, is save the old Monterey County Jail. So that really illustrates what AMAP is about, is identifying places that are under threat, buildings especially that are under threat, and working to preserve them, working with the public, working with the, the neighbors, working with the Board of Supervisors and City Councils. So that's what we're about, what our mission is. So we would like you, if possible, to join us and become a member and come to our, our meetings. So this is, um, I'll introduce Raymond. Raymond brought our speaker tonight. And we, this is a little bit different from what I, usually our talks are more purely about architecture, but this goes off into the field of combining the built environment, preservation, and the surroundings, our building, our surroundings, with public health, because we know that there's a connection. And Dr. Jackson has worked on that and will be talking to us about that. So it's my pleasure to introduce my longtime friend, Dr. Richard Jackson. Uh, we work together at the California Department of Public Health. And, um, uh, Dick is a pediatrician and epidemiologist, uh, has worked in uh, um, environmental health issues, ended up heading the division at the Centers for Disease Control that dealt with that, then came back to California and was our public health officer in, in the Department of Public Health, and most recently was a professor at UCLA and he has uh, uh, written books and documentaries about the impact of design on the public health. So, um, you're all very distinguished folks, but I want to point out a couple of my heroes besides Dr. Neutra here. One is your health officer now from Monterey County, uh, Dr. Ed Moreno, who's had a wonderful career. I know when he was in the Central Valley, I was the health officer. And his daughter was one of my students at UCLA at one time. He's just finishing her residency in pediatrics. And you're both, he and sister are new grand, relatively new grandparents. So it's a pleasure to have them here as old friends. And the other is Bob Nelton, who was one of my colleagues and heroes from the 1980s and 90s. And so we did a lot of work around farm worker and pesticides uh, issues. In fact, that was my, one of my jobs when I was in California before I went off to CDC. And uh, Marty is here as well. I don't need to snub anybody else, but if anybody else I should introduce before we get started. But it's an honor to have these. These are really hard jobs. And I will tell you, I will confess that I woke up about two weeks ago and the whole world was in a hubbub about coronavirus. And I thought, and I was laying there in the bed, and it was raining out. And the nice thing about being retired is staying in bed when it's cold and rainy outside. But, um, I, and they were talking about, all of a sudden, I thought, oh, thank God, I don't have to do a press conference on coronavirus. That's something I know nothing about right now, and no one knows anything about. But they still want you to do a press conference, right? And, uh, and you know, uh, I never was bored for one minute in public health. And people say, Oh, you went into public health, you left pediatrics because you wanted gentleman medicine. I'll tell you, it's as rough and tumble as anything you could imagine in clinical medicine. 
and some of you know that. The book on the right is my most recent uh, book. We're working on a new version of it and making health in places. And, and the book on the left is uh, the companion book for my four-hour public broadcasting series that aired a few years ago. It was seen by about four million people. And the good thing about that is um, it actually made a lot of what I was talking about common sense. Am I too low, too loud? Uh, further out. Put your mic a little um, farther away from your face. Let me try this. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. I, look, I grew up in New Jersey, so if I'm talking loud, I'm not mad. It's just the way it is, you know? <laughs> in, in my class, um, I, I, have a, I had about half public health students and half architecture, urban planning, environment, and other kinds of students, and I would always match them up for their final project with someone from not from their discipline. And one of my favorites, they had to do, they had about six weeks to work on it. And the young man, a young man partnered with the, he was from urban planning, she was from public health. He picks TODs. I don't know what a TOD is, but it's a transit-oriented development. It's the big deal about putting a lot of housing, there's laws cooking around this, a lot of housing near transit stops. You know, out there in Lafayette, there's miles and miles of parking lots and there's no housing, and that's where you actually want to have people be able to live close. Um, and the young woman picked violence against women and, and, and thought a lot. And so they get together and they don't like each other. And they're, she's like, you know, you don't, you don't care enough about women. And he's like, you don't understand this. She didn't realize that everything you're looking at, everything you're looking at, was in someone's mind at some point in the past. The design of that clock back there, everything in this room is the product of someone's imagination. And so what people are thinking is really important. And he didn't realize that women don't like walking on enclosed stairways with no doors and no daylight and not knowing what's around the next corner. And so, and he had never really appreciated um, policing through environmental design. In other words, when you have good sight lines, crime goes down. So they, they worked together and they did one of the best presentations at the end of the course, and they got married. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm joking a little bit, they didn't get married right away, but where I'm going is that public health and urban planning and design and architecture were married in 1880, 1890, 1900. You didn't need to go to medical school to know that if you lived in a basement room with, you know, rodents and vermin and, and lots of uh, dirt and other things, that you were more likely to get TB. You were more likely to get a whole bunch of diseases and you wouldn't fight them off as well. Everybody knew that living in bad dwellings, but then everybody got in cars in 1920, 30, 40, and especially in 1950, drove off, left the inner city alone. We don't need to worry about urban planning. Half the founders of the American Public Health Association in 1885 or so were actually urban planners. There were people thinking about physical environments. So we forgot all that. When I was in public health, I think the battery. It's the first rule to have one of these things and let the battery go dead. It's my own fault. It is even worse. Maybe it's the protector. Why did when public health? I, it took me a long time and a fair amount of self-confrontation uh, to realize it probably was related to this. And some of you were of an age where um, this was. Me. I'm a war baby, and uh, some of us are. But where I'm going with this is uh, President Roosevelt declared war, the, and the Congress declared war the next day. And the entire might of the United States government, all of our industrial strength, Roosevelt literally called the heads of GM, Ford, Chrysler, and those, come on in, you're going to meet me. You're not making any more trucks, you're not making any more cars, you're making tanks, you're making airplanes. Everything goes into the war effort. And it completely transformed the United States. We had a single vision about winning that war. We had two fronts that we really had to confront during that time. On that same day, this young man, then 18 years old, um, fresh out of high school, volunteered for the Air Force, um, didn't actually get inducted for a year or so, 
and went off uh, receiving, that was the day he received his wings in San Antonio. Here he is, first plane crash uh, came down, and the second one was, uh, the plane was, he was flying P-40s and P-51s, um, survived an attack in his barracks where half the pilots were killed, um, and he's over Iwo Jima, they were flying the escort missions. The bombers would come in are, are from Saipan and head towards Japan, and they would pick up the fighters as they went over Iwo Jima. He came back after the war, of course, and married his high school sweetheart, and magically had three babies in three years. I he didn't know where they came from, and, um, and it was a pretty happy time. He was running, he was flying a lot in Maine, and, and running the airport in Portland, Maine. Um, and then one day in August of 1949, he discovered that he's 27 years old. This guy could do 100 push-ups at a time. He couldn't take a deep breath. He was put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital, and within a, a day, um, he died of polio. Uh, there were no iron lungs in me. And uh, I remember my grandmother, and they all came up from New Jersey because my parents were Jersey folks at that time, and I put my mother and the three little kids in the car, and we went back to uh, New Jersey. My grandmother said, well, I wasn't even four years old. You're the man of the family now. And um, so it was very hard. I mean, it was like we went from being reasonably middle class secure to dirt poor in Newark, New Jersey. And um, here's the release from uh, quarantine uh, after three weeks. Maybe my poor mother devastated sitting there with three little boys in the house, couldn't go out because we were under quarantine. That term has a real meaning right now for lots of reasons. And um, I think. After a couple of sidebars, I ended up thinking I wanted to be a doctor. And then after I met most of the doctors, I decided that I didn't like them, but I really liked the pediatricians, so I would be a pediatrician. Um, and I'm not exaggerating about that. <laughs> and here I am in 1975 when I had red hair. And I had spent a lot of three months, about two months, taking care of twins that were born, you know, 12 weeks premature. And this is the day we were sending one of them home. And I remember thinking, we probably spent in those days $150,000 on the medical care of these two children, and much more maybe. And they were going to go home with an 18, 19 year old mother to a squalid home. And I began to think more and more about where people live really matters to people's health. <coughs> uh, I wanted to work on social justice issues, ended up doing uh, work on farm workers and, and pesticides and other such issues. But I really want to go back and do, I thought I want to do public health. I didn't realize it was my father calling me at the time, but I think that's probably what was going on there. Yeah. One of the things we do in pediatrics, and everybody recognizes this, is the growth chart. And if your grandchild is uh, 28th, 25th percentile for height and weight, you want them to stay in that track. You don't want them to drop off, and you don't want them to go up to 100 percentile for weight if he's still the same height. It's one of the most important vital signs that we can get in a child. My pediatric friends, and Ed will, um, will uh, verify this, are seeing two or three, sometimes four children a day like this. Child comes in, he's eight years old, 10 years old, his height's fine, but his weight is almost a 95th percentile. His blood pressure, if you're that overweight, is too high. His blood sugar is a little too high. He's not full-blown diabetic, but the sugar is too high. The cholesterol is too high, and he's depressed. He feels sort of marginalized in his neighborhood and by the other kids. And so uh, a good doc will immediately um, put the child on medicines and, you know, let's try and change your life. And, um, no TV in the bedroom, better night's sleep. Sleep is good for us in all kinds of ways, including weight maintenance. And two months later, the child comes back. <laughs> and what's changed? Of course, nothing. He can't change the food in school. We've built neighborhoods where he can't walk to school. Um, he, perhaps the, both parents are working, and mom's a single parent, and you know, do not stop on the way home, stay in the house, turn on the TV, but I, you have to be there when I come home. And I'll stop at a fast food place because the food's an hour long uh, when I get home. And so a month after that, the child's taking, and you know, this could be an adult, something with blood pressure, cholesterol, depression, and 
it's $400 a month. I've made up this story, but every doc in the room is going to go, oh yeah, this is exactly the way it works. And lots of adults are on this cocktail as well. Where I'm going with this is that we have essentially medicalized what I will assert to be environmentally induced disease. We have created environments that make people less physically active, more socially lonely. <coughs> and uh, so, uh, as I finished my residency, I thought about doing more and more pediatrics. And um, children are very interesting because they are the absorber of their entire environment. So they absorb social, they absorb chemicals, they absorb food, sunlight. They are the integrator of their environments. And so, the, the thinking about them as this uh, machine that sucks things up around them. And yet we don't build environments with a view towards kids being more exposed. I had a big battle with Marianne Moses one time, who was Cesar Chavez's doctor, and she said, Dick, you're worried about changing all these pesticide policies. You're just doing trickle-down public health. I'm doing the real work taking care of the individual farm workers. And of course, I understood what she was saying, but I was more interested, in, and we ended up succeeding with this, and Bob was an important help on this, was to get rid of about a third of all the chemicals were being used. They just shouldn't have been used. They did not have adequate testing. Change the amount of how, amount that could be used, change how often it could be used, and change the amount of time that it took before people could go back into the workplace. Turned out lead poisoning was a big issue. I lived in L.A. I had no idea that L.A. was a huge lead poisoning city because it had more old houses than um, most cities on the East Coast. When I was young, when I, I, when I was doing rotations as a medical student, you'd go on the ward and you'd see 20, 30 children being chelated, getting chemicals dumped into their blood to pull out um, the lead in their bodies and other calcium and everything else from their bodies. And we always had about 10 children a year in the major cities die of lead poisoning. It was so overwhelming. So this business is about not setting up a protections that really protect the most sensitive members of the population is really important. So many of your grandparents, your grandparents, you all know that the child's occupation is to absorb its environment. You know, if you were rolling around on the floor naked sucking on your hands, we'd worry about you. But it's perfectly normal behavior for a one-year-old, right? And they, they eat and drink three to four times as much, and breathe three to four times as much per pound of body weight as does an adult. By the way, you can all have, Raymond will have his slides, and you can all have the slides and use them for whatever you want. So say you see this again. This is a special Raymond Moitra story. Over there at, uh, in Berkeley, they had Martin Luther King Park, and they had these wooden cedar uh, play structures, and they were treated with CCA. Anybody want to know what CCA is? They were dipped in copper, chromium, big time carcinogen, and arsenic. And the kids were crawling up this thing, and you know, children never put their hands in their mouth, right? Well, we finally, we kept saying, we don't think it's good for kids to be playing on this and handling it. And finally, a brave colleague went and dipped his hands in deionized water. I think he actually ended up drinking some of it, and they detected copper chromium arsenic in his urine. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the man that got rid of CCH in that playground Subjects Approval Committee because it never would have happened. <laughs> I've probably told the story a little bit, you know, I got the sense, right? <coughs> so, 1975, I went off to CDC. Is Ken Bernard here? No. Okay. I went off to CDC and I began to learn about the big picture. I was sent to India to do smallpox eradication. This is my first stint at CDC. But I want you to look. One of the things I learned in my early public health career, and Bob's worked overseas quite a bit, is the more a country spends on medical care, sorta, sorta, the longer people live. So this is a few years ago, but uh, Norway spends $5,800 on medical care and they live to be 85 years old. That's really good. So in general, it helps to spend money on medical care. Is there a country left out from this? We spend seven times as much per capita 
as the people in Costa Rica spend, and they live exactly as long as we do. And so we have totally underspent on prevention in the United States and overspent on particularly end of life, but stuff that really doesn't make that much difference in our overall quality of lifespan. Of the 30 years of increased lifespan that have occurred since my grandmother was born, how many years came from medical care? The thing we're spending now $3 trillion a year on. 25 years have come from prevention, and thank goodness for antibiotics, but the two big eyes are immunization, back to the story about polio, and infrastructure. Better environments, safer workplaces, cleaner air, cleaner food, cleaner water, changing the environment to make it healthier for people has one of the big contributors to having people live longer. But it's something the government has to do. It's not something you individually have much control over other than to demand the government be accountable. In the old days, even in my father's time, infectious disease was big killers, and maybe it will be again, but in general these are chronic diseases that are costing us most of the money. Diabetes, Ed's working with us all the time. Of, of how do we reduce chronic diseases, the costs of chronic diseases, and help people be healthy? I have to tell you this story. When I was a health officer, I had to go on this AM radio show. And the AM radio announcer was a nasty guy. He smelled of tobacco and had a red face. And I walked in and he said, oh, you're the state health officer of Schwarzenegger, huh? <laughs> so yes, I am. So, um, well, if you work for the government, you must be either corrupt, stupid, or lazy. So one of the least welcoming greetings I had to say. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, actually, um, I'm not corrupt. I try and be as honest. I don't tell everybody everything I know, but I'm not corrupt. Um, I'm not lazy. I work real hard. But the essence of medicine is I endlessly feel at the edge of my knowledge. I'm always having to look around and find somebody that knows more about something than I do. And the job of public health is not to order people around not to be the nanny state. The job of public health is to give people the conditions where people can be healthy. So you'll see where I'm going with that as I begin to talk about the 20th century. 21st century. I went off the CDC in 1994, and uh, I was sworn in by uh, Dr. David Satcher, who eventually became Surgeon General. And my, I had to swear that I would protect, sort of protect the Constitution of the United States, just like every single person that had to be on that jury last week. So this red tie is not one of the red ties you see up other people, but I. I've had quite an education as the importance of law, the importance of the Constitution, and the importance of the Bill of Rights. Um, but I, I was sworn in. I had pulled my three kids and my wife out of Berkeley. We moved to Atlanta. Uh, we thought this is great. We moved from a small um, cottage to a, a mansion that cost $100,000 less because that's the way um, Atlanta is. The job was fascinating. Turns out all this pesticide stuff I knew was totally useful because we had oversight of the destruction of the chemical weapons in the United States. There were enough chemical weapons just Addison, Alabama, to kill every mammal on the face of the earth. And I'm not making this stuff up. We had the nuclear stuff. I was over in Russia all the time looking at nuclear issues. We had the lead poisoning program, we had birth defects prevention programs, and it was totally fascinating. One of the ones that was most fascinating was um, measuring chemical levels, body burdens, in people, because that was something we really wanted in epidemiology. Because asking people, were you exposed to something a year ago, is totally useless information. We wanted to really be able to do this. So I loved the job, but my kids had gone to schools that looked like the ones uh, in this. Um, but then we moved to Atlanta, and we had one in middle school and two in grammar school, and they were sent to medium security grammar schools. <laughs> and where I'm going with this is, there was a, believe it or not, there was a belief in the 60s that if kids could look out the window, they couldn't learn very well. So they built school, and, and of course there was a metal detector, and there were guards everywhere, and there were no potted plants for kids, and there were no doors in the restrooms because bad things could happen in the restrooms, and, it was pretty bad, but, and they couldn't walk home because the school was one of these conglomerate schools 
that held, you know, 2,000 kids. There wasn't a single sidewalk within three miles of school. They had to be driven there and back. The worst traffic jams in Atlanta are around school delivery time uh, as well. And literally, the school, uh, these younger two were like this one at the bottom right. And by the way, it's the same architect we're in for prisons. The second thing I discovered in Atlanta was there was a wreck somewhere on my commute every single day. And it's partly because you couldn't go anywhere unless you got in a car. And I kept thinking everybody's drunk, but I think it was just, it's really hard to drive frantically. You've you're, you got two hours to get an hour to, you got 10 miles to go and it takes you an hour and a half. People get crazy after a while. Um, in fact, at, at UCLA, I always ask my students, so, hey, uh, what was the worst part of your day? School? Lunch? After school? What's the worst part of your day? The commute. Every single American has the same answer. It's my commute that's killing me. And by the way, Atlanta was ridiculous because they took huge, two huge highways, 75 and 85, merged them together into a six-lane road and thought that that would be the solution to the city. Um, and I became very active with the Atlanta Regional Commission on how to think about parks that can, can connect the whole area together. So. I was becoming more and more depressed. My wife wasn't happy. My kids weren't happy. Um, I liked the job very much. But uh, I'm driving down Buford Highway. And at the time, I was reading a wonderful book called The Clearing in the Distance by, about Frederick Law Olmsted. And, but I was really blue. And I needed something other than Zoloft. I needed, uh, I needed to actually think about a life change that would be much more satisfying. I was spending a lot of time worrying about parts per million and parts per billion of chemicals you know, in the environment. I was worried about the, you know, the ice pack and the, the Arctic and the Antarctic. But you know, I'm not really making much of a difference about how people live. And as I'm driving down Buford Highway, I look over to the right side of the road. Here's this elderly woman walking along in 98 degree heat, 90% humidity. She's bent over with osteoporosis and she has a heavy shopping bag, one in each hand, and she has red hair and she looks like my mother. And I want to stop and pick her up and give her a ride. But I'm going off to headquarters to a meeting with the boss and I don't do it. And I'm sitting there and we're talking about all this distant stuff and I'm thinking, that poor woman collapses and dies, the cause of death will be heat stroke. And it won't be absence of trees, absence of public transportation. If she's killed by a truck going by, it'll be motor vehicle trauma. But it won't be absence of sidewalks, absence of public transportation, poor urban planning. And so I, I went back to my house. I literally called my friend Howard Frumpkin, who eventually became my co-author. I said, Howie, I think we're worried about the wrong stuff. People really care about where they live. They care about where their elderly parents live. They care about where their kids live. And we're all focused on distant stuff that's kind of remote to people's daily lives. And he said, that's great, Dick. I need to go on a sabbatical. Could you find money and pay for my sabbatical and I'll come work? <laughs> and, and he did. It was, it was great. And we, every week, the nice thing about CDC is I could invite the smartest people around on any single topic, pay their way, and they'd be happy to come in and hold forth for an hour or two with us. What's the message of that particular structure? What is it telling you about the most important thing in that family's life? They have surrounded, they've made their habitation surround the most important thing in their lives. Yeah. In fact, if it's an automatic garage door opener, you can, and you have people do your lawn, you can, you can live there for years and never meet a single other human being and just drive in and close the door. This is a picture of the California state flower. It's not the top. <laughs> in the 1950s, we decided everybody would be healthier if we just abandoned the cities, moved out in the suburbs, spread out. So we have now paved over one sixth, uh, 60,000 square miles of American landscape. That's a lot of photosynthesis to be removed. It's the equivalent area of the state of Georgia. Um, we have. 
parking places alone account for an area equivalent to the entire area of the island of Puerto Rico. And by the way, every car needs four parking spaces. I'm not making that up. I'm sure the data. And California has more cars than it has licensed drivers. So you can see the spin here. Um, and frankly, you know, we, we talk about discrimination and disempowerment. The most disempowered people in our society are people that don't drive. You know, you're too old, you're too young, you're, um, uh, you know, you have a disability, you're too poor. And by the way, what happens when it rains on that parking lot after the hot sun's been on and all the tire rubbings and the asbestos from the brakes and the lead from the wheel balancing things, what happens when it rains? That stuff all goes in the river as well. I'm going to skip these two. So one of the real problems is, well, let me give you an example. This is, suppose you moved into uh, this house. <coughs> and you had only lived there a few months and, you know, Easter's coming up and, and you know, I'd like to get together. I've made friends with people on the other side of the fence and maybe we could uh, get together and have a, a picnic and, and uh, say, so, all right, come on over. And, you know, you make the hot dogs and beans or whatever it would be, at Easter ham. But you really don't want to throw it over the fence. <laughs> so, and you don't want to throw the baby over the fence. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll walk there. But I actually know the way. I'm new here. Um, I better look it up. So I go to Google, I figure out how to get to the house 65 feet away, and I Google, I find out it's seven miles away by car and 17 minutes of driving to um, get to the house 65 feet away. This is actually true, and it's absurd, but the reason I put it in here is the, the last thing we think about when we build, we think about return on investment for the developer, for the bank, for someone else, but we don't think about what happens to people when you put them in these settings. So one of the most very difficult to live in places like this if you don't have a car, if you lose your job and suddenly, you know, you're trying to job hunt and you're living in a place like this, or you're, how about this, and we can feature this in the TV series, you're a 15 year old girl, you've got a bunch of friends from school and, and you know, what can we do? Well. We can ask mom to take us to the mall. There's literally nothing in Atlanta, only other places are almost as bad. Half the parks you could not get into unless you were in a car because of the way it was designed. It was all for car access. <laughs> um, I'll skip this because I'm running out of time. Sitting in a car is mostly not good for you. Obviously, car crashes, but it raises your blood pressure, your blood, your cholesterol, your cortisol, your risk of having a heart attack, and it stays, that risk stays elevated for the, about an hour after you were in it. Um, <laughs> thinking you're going to pour more concrete is going to make it better. I think one of the tragedies in California is to have the wonderful soils of Salinas and Monterey County covered increasingly by concrete. And watch one of those big box things going up off 101. As I was coming down, and it's tragic. You know, we do need to build up. I'll stay with it right now. <coughs> I hear I gave a talk in Klamath Falls, and somebody said to me, um, "You know, all these city people are coming out and ruining our countryside, and they're moving out and out and out. And what is this? I, I live in the country, and I, I, I don't want this." And, and they also wanted to keep their one-way streets with um, all over like Klamath Falls. I said, "Well, actually, if you don't want people moving out there," Make the downtown area much more appealing and much more interesting and culturally alive, and they won't move out there and bother you. So, keeping people in cities is actually much, your carbon footprint is about seven times less if you do this. The most prevalent disorder in America after tooth decay is depression. You're, you know the treatment for depression, the non chemical treatment for depression. It's physical activity, it's socializing, it's music, it's being with people that love you and care about you and you care about. And yet, we, if we, anything we do that increases loneliness is bad for your health. Anything we can do that improves air quality is good for your health. This is, looks like a boring slide I always teach my students. If it's boring, it's important, like the Office of Management and Budget and the Senate Rules Committee, they're important. Um, these are real pulmonary function casks 
by school kids in L.A. And everybody said, oh, you know, we had to, get, uh, we had to have more expensive gasoline and a better gasoline mix and car, uh, catalytic converters. Look what happened to pulmonary function tests. In other words, in the 1980s, about 7% of the kids failed their pulmonary function tests. The same comparable group, just 10 years later, with better air quality, only 4% did. That was a big improvement. You don't get that kind of, and by the way, your lung function as a young person is a very good, unless you smoke, is a very good predictor of how long you're going to live. We've changed how kids can walk and bike to school. How many of you walked or biked to school as a kid? Yeah. How many have children or grandchildren that walk or bike to school? You got it. It's, but it's tough going, right? We make, <laughs> we make pedestrians third class citizens over and over again. No one would, would dream of saying the road out front of your house is the responsibility of the homeowner, and yet we make the sidewalk, which is just as essential, the responsibility of the homeowner. And people become, you know, they love our cars, and we sit in the cars, and so here's this dog trying to take the owner for a walk, and the owner's resisting constantly. But did you know that um, dog owners actually live longer than non-dog owners? Maya is doing something. But it's the walk. You know, maybe the love, too, but the walk and the <coughs> I'm going to skip a few more. Ed, I apologize. You've seen these a million times, but I'm always shocked. This, when I got to CDC, um, CDC actually does all these questionnaires to figure out how you, they ask all kinds of questions, but one of them is the height and weight. And here's 1990. Here's the year 2000. So California, we're up to about 15 to 20 percent of Californians are obese adults. And here's 2016 with about 25 percent. And you can see that red states have a new meaning because uh, they're at sort of 30 percent of the adults are obese. <laughs> Lots of causes, inactivity is one of them. Look at this. EMA tells you that we shouldn't be regulating sugar. High fructose corn sugar, you didn't have it as a child. And to, this is the per capita disappearance of high fructose corn sugar in the American. 64 pounds. By the way, only your liver can break down fructose. Not your muscles, not your brain, only your liver. So it's actually a risk factor for fatty liver along with alcohol and other things. But it's not something you don't want a fatty liver. So I'll skip that one, but I have to show you this one. For fun, I, I, I and colleagues did a calculation of how much additional jet fuel we burned, um, comparing what we average weighed in 1990 versus what we weighed in the year 2000. And it came out to one and a half billion dollars worth of jet fuel to haul our additional metaposity that we had gained just in the 90s, I'm sure. There's been subsequent more elaborate studies, but it's real. It's the only study I've ever done. It was the most cited study I've ever done. It wasn't even a study. It was a back of the envelope calculation. Um, it was cited by Jay Leno, who said, <laughs> CDC says that we're all getting um, too fat, and they're burning too much fuel in the airlines. Now I know why they don't feed us on airplanes anymore. <laughs> so, um, as you were. This is a, it's, it's boring, so therefore it's important. This is as your body mass goes up, your risk of becoming a developing diabetes goes up. So I'm not proud of this, but I'm at about 29 BMI. So I have six times the risk of getting diabetes than as I did back when I was skinny. But if I were a woman, I'd have 27 times the risk of getting this disease. So the risks go up much more dramatically. They go up for everybody the more we gain the risk of getting diabetes. So what do you think happened to the diabetes maps? 1995, 2003, 2016. So go down the street in Mitch McConnell's backyard, and 16% of the adults have diabetes. Not pre-diabetes, diabetes. These are huge numbers. Diabetes costs you your eyes, your kidneys, and your feet, and eventually your heart. So these are big, big costly risks. Average reduction of lifespan for about seven to ten years. 
I was doing pediatrics. I never saw a child with type 2 diabetes. We called it adult onset diabetes. Um, now, we're, half the kids in the clinic, and this is not me speaking, this is the way the Journal of Medicine, half the kids in the diabetes clinic had adult onset diabetes. So we're seeing 16 year olds with diseases of 60 year olds, 66 year olds. Um, again, it's not exactly good. Joints go bad, you know, you have all kinds of conditions where you begin to gain too much weight and you also carry too much sugar. I've been pretty depressing, and I know it doesn't matter whether you do 10,000 steps, but you've got to walk. And these, this is a classic study that showed that walking was better than the other three drugs, metformin and um, fenfen, and I actually did fenfen and something else in that study. But the least number of complications, the most benefits came from walking. That's why it's led these efforts. <coughs> if you already have diabetes, I'm sure some of you in this room would have the disease. Your survival, the upper curve, it's sort of boring and ugly, but the upper curve is better survival for people who are more active. I'm skip this. Not only is physical activity good for your diabetes and your pancreas and your liver, it's also good for your brain. A classic study looking at the brain size um, in people my age. And those that walked, about half of them were doing physical activity 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Their brain size actually increased slightly, and those that did no physical activity, their brain shrunk. Brain size doesn't matter so much in early life, but it, it has actually a pretty good predictor later on. This is amazing. These are real physical exams done on 5,000 people a year, every year in the United States. I won't give you the details. Um, Comparing exact same demographics, 15, 20 years apart, excellent health, look what happened. Same demographics, people in their 50s. Limitations of life functions, do you need a wheelchair or assistance? You know, these people are in their 50s. You know, smoking went down, you know, obesity went up. You didn't know, and I didn't know what this next slide is going to say. We need to see this. We doctors have been wagging our fingers at people for 30 years, saying 40 years, you got to walk, you got to exercise. Want to see how successful we've been? No, regular physical activity. So maybe the big takeaway on this is, if you want to prevent chronic disease, if you want to make people healthier, you've got to make physical activity irresistible. You have to create places that entice us to want to walk. You can't change the weather, but you certainly can have decent sidewalks that are shaded and good destinations and eyes on the street and make it safe and have smiling faces that meet you along the way. And you will get people to walk. And if you put a park there or a river, it's even better. People love walking near water. Um, thinking about solutions, when I became a health officer, I explained to Governor Schwarzenegger, we had to eat a lot less doof. And by the way, doof was being advertised at $250,000 a second during the Super Bowl. I'm not making that up. So it was like 50 million a minute or something to eat this kind of stuff. And um, we got to eat more food, good healthy food. I was there. Um, my wife said this is when I was the Secret Service man guarding the <laughs> But, um, you know, this is good for the California economy. At the same time, it's good for our health. Why not? Sorry, folks, we have got to tax sugar and sugar sweetened beverages. I tried to talk the governor into it. This was 15 years ago. It was not something he was willing to take on. But um, Berkeley did. And Berkeley put the tax in place. It's not prohibitive. Everybody said, well, the smart town retailers will go out of business. But in fact, they did just fine. People bought more and more water, and it raised about $150,000 for the school uh, health programs. Um, and really nobody was hurt by really putting a nickel on a bottle of tax on sugar sweetened beverages. This is the, one of the books I did with Howard Frumpkin, and now I don't know where I put it here. Oh, Solutions, all right. Um, yeah, I'm almost finished, but I swear this is true. So, you know, I'm depressed. I'm sort of dealing with my depression. I'm going to do something, and so, um, I write an article for Sprawl Watch saying, the way we're building America is killing people. 
And, you know, sitting in a car is bad for you, and we're indifferent to people's needs. And the last thing we think about is, is physical activity. And nobody should walk into a building and have to look for a stairway. It'll be right there. And one, one flight of stairs a day is one pound of body fat burned off in a year. And we need to reintroduce physical activity in the daily lives and change tax policies and mortgage policies. And I thought it was a pretty good report. Somehow the National Association of Home Builders really didn't like it. And they got a dozen members of Congress to write to the head of CDC and said, fire that fool Jackson. He doesn't have, he doesn't know what he's talking about. In fact, people that live in suburbs live longer than people that live in cities. It's actually kind of true, but it's an epidemiologic fallacy. Who tended to live in the cities in 2001? They're mainly a lot more poor people. Nowadays, it isn't quite so much. So they weren't looking at poverty or income. They were just saying, hey, the suburbanites live longer. They're, you know, healthy. Dr. Um, Copeland did not fire me. He did say, Dick, you have to shut up. Until you have more data, you have to shut up. But that's the purpose of showing you we now have enormous amounts of data. It is now the policy. It's a prescription from the American Academy of Pediatrics that children need to grow up where they can walk to school, have increasing autonomy. And this is as much for physical life, physical life, it's as much for mental health and resilience and life um, competence as it is for strength and physical activity. The uh, National Academy of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, came out and said the first thing we need to do to deal with the obesity epidemic is really think about the design of cities that entice people to be physically active. These are very big, expensive reports. Light rail actually helps people lose weight. This is Charlotte, North Carolina, and they happen to be doing a study for a totally different reason, but offhandedly asked a couple thousand people, do you use the new transit train? And at the end of um, two years, those who use transit have lost about six and a half pounds, and much fewer were in the zone of uh, obesity. When I was health officer, you know, you kept thinking, well, dealing with the health department would make a difference. Actually, Caltrans turned out to be more important than the health department. Because Caltrans gets, makes big decisions, and one of the things they decided was to actually move state routes out of the center of town. Think about that for a minute. If you run a state route through the center of town, they're always fast. And, you, and they used to connect small towns to small towns, but by actually bypassing Bishop, bypassing these smaller towns, so that people who want to drive in a hurry aren't driving right through the center of town, it's actually much safer and it's better for uh, lots of things. So, but I particularly am proud of this because every middle manager at Caltrans now is asked, what are you doing to improve health? And I guarantee you, 10 years ago, nobody asked them, what do you do to improve health, air quality, social connectedness? <clears throat> Surgeon General's report on why we needed to walk. Completely designed of buildings, Mary, and this is, um, the, I was on the board of the American Institute of Architects and also advised Urban Land Institute for the big developers. And they, they say the right things, so we'll, we'll see how much happens. No one would dream of putting in a lobby or a building without some welcoming stairways. It's really, be like building that's not sustainable at this point, it would be seen as bad practice. Kaiser Permanente has adopted this, I always love this one. Um, how did they get this picture past their safety people? <laughs> and, you know, building for what makes people happy. People that live in places where they can connect to their neighbors are happy. This is, uh, remember I was telling the terror about um, Atlanta? There was a graduate student at Georgia Tech who discovered there were a bunch of railroad spurs that surrounded the city of Atlanta, 38 miles of railroad spurs, that went through some of the parks. And he came up with an idea called the Beltline. And the Beltline now is about half built. It's the largest public health, public works project, a um, string of parks with bike routes. Yes, it's caused gentrification. Everybody wants to live there. But that's a lot better than nobody wants to live there and you're scared to, to be there. So, um, that's a different discussion if we talk about gentrification and the um, I've worked very hard on urban river parkways and the vision is to 
the Los Angeles River is 56 miles. It looks like a, mm -hmm. a sluice, a sewer, mm -hmm. and it really needs to be the heart of the city with bike routes going up to the city itself, up to Pasadena, and down to the ocean. And people could actually reconnect. By the way, those are very poor, very obese, very inactive communities. There's a lot that could be done making life easier for people that look like this. And kids that have never even seen a bird um, or an egret or something like that could really benefit from this. I'll skip that one. Um, this is not bad for business. This is the High Line in New York City. The High Line was, and there's a kernel in this. This is a wasted railroad route running along the third floor of the west side. Um, and you can see, now when you're on this, it goes about 15 blocks. You can see the Statue of Liberty over here, and the Empire State Building over here. And it's the 10th most visited tourist destination in the world. People want to go there. And yes, it's gentrified. The old meatpacking dangerous district, now people want to live there. It's become Brooklyn and all that sort of thing. So I can't solve everything, but making things. Do you do cyclodeas here or bicycle events when you do road closures at Great. Yes, yeah. Great. The story about this one in LA is uh, they closed Wilshire Boulevard and the retail was against it, the cops were against it, the transit was against it, everybody was against it. Mayor Villaragosa said, we're going to close it down and everybody's going to bike on that Sunday and it'll be 10 miles of biking. Crime went down, business went up, and um, the classic big picture in front of the LA Times was a family of three. The kids said, boy, that was really fun. And the woman said, this is beautiful. I had no idea the buildings were so beautiful. And it was really, really beautiful. And the man said, I got to work faster than I did in my car. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's a way of just, we human beings don't like being in unfamiliar situations. You've got to break the ice. So I have an ugly part of Cyclovia because it got started down in South America and I went down there and they stole my backpack. But other than that, it was fun. Urban Land Institute, these are all the big developers and these are the rules for building healthy communities. Um, and we put a lot of work into this, but I'm going to just tell you number five. We need to make, if people aren't going to exercise, you've got to make it easy. You know, we're not going to kick them and drag them out and make them uh, be physically active, but this is, um, we can create environments that are so enticing they can't resist. So, um, God bless you all. You have been so patient sticking with this. And by the way, I've got another half hour on climate change, but I'm not going to subject it to you. Uh, you'll have to invite me back. Good. I'll do well at some time. But uh, um, this has been a real gift. I mean, and I get to work with, I never thought I'd work with the American Institute of Architects. I thought I'd work with pediatricians. I never thought I'd work with them. Developers, landscape architects are totally cool. So, and the transit, transportation people, I gave a talk to the transportation engineers. They were a thousand of the Disneyland Hotel. And I talked about, you're health leaders, you're important to health. I'm not kidding. I must have had 50 who brought to me after and said, I had no idea I, what I did mattered to health. So, I think the idea of health reaching out beyond our own boundaries and seeing health as something that's present in our entire lives and how we create that is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to stop at that point and thank you so much for your attention. Do you have any questions for Dr. Jackson? Yes, you can have the slides. I'll take your time and those out. Do it next time. How do we force the evil developers to comply with this? Awesome. Awesome. You know, that's a very good question. Developers are talking. Thank you. How do you get the developers to really embrace the right stuff? Well, one is you have to have, that's why there's a cookbook and a toolkit because this is how you can do this. Two is how do you negotiate with you? The marketplace is very tough because an awful lot of housing now is going into second homes, and Carmel Valley is dealing with this right now. The problem with second homes and vacation homes is they're not good citizens. And not that they're bad people throwing garbage on the street, but they, they don't really socially engage. They're really not present with the schools and not present 
with the community. New York is suffering from this terribly because you have the richest people in the world buying huge amounts of property and you know on the, and pay minimal taxes because of the way the thing is set up. Um, and not really employing that many people. They come in and vacuum an empty apartment once a week or something. So um, the, the marketplace really is the, the big issue. Um, the housing and the Federal Reserve has really given, the Federal Reserve, particularly under Janet Yellen, has been giving a lot of thought to economic policy, Fannie Mae and, and other such issues. How do you create economic incentives to do the right thing? So right now it is much easier than plow down a forest, scrape off all the high quality dirt, put in some pipes underneath, put in some paving, and pop up buildings that cost 100 grand and turn around and sell them for $800,000. So the economic incentives to flip this stuff, the, you know, the farmers always say the last crop is houses, and so we've got to think about, it. and there is some of this, but Williamson Act and preservation of land is very important as well. It's a big deal, though. There's a big um, development out far side of Mount Diablo and um, out towards Tracy and those places. Now, when I was young, Caltuan Pass was a pretty easy drive. Now it's it's like LA. It's, it's just rural. And so there absolutely has to be high speed transit coming in from that place. And actually you know, it's not simply because I lived in Berkeley and talked <coughs> UCLA. I'm very sad the high speed rail has seems to have flopped. And actually I'm going to stay with that for I don't believe in environmental impact assessment. Exactly. How has Europe managed to make bicycle commuting so easy for its people? So let me back up for two points. Um, one is we need health impact assessment. By that I mean instead of looking at environmental impacts, we need to look to optimize decisions because every decision we do, anything we do is going to have negatives. You can always find any, anything we do. If you give somebody a medicine, it's got negatives. You want to optimize. You, know, you have the choice between surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, or nothing. You optimize. You do the best thing you can. How did Europe do this? Um, one is they made gasoline very expensive. And so um, two is they've created incentives to keep open land open. So it's much harder to build on green space. It's much easier to build in, in inner urban areas. And they put the bike routes in in place. Three is you need a strong executive. So one of the problems in Atlanta, I remember a couple of years ago Atlanta got stopped by a two inch snowstorm and it was kind of a scandal and it turned out that the decisions were dispersed across 300 jurisdictions about whether people could go home and what we should be doing and, and so you, you actually have to have more effective central planning. We've got Sandag in LA, we've got um, ABAG in the Bay Area, but they're very, very weak. I'm not saying we ought to give them more power, but there ought to be more engagement at a regional level. Because it makes sense. New York City, has, for all its problems, has something called the Regional Plan Association, RPA. And you read their reports, they're thinking about um, what happens with when we lose Newark Airport, Cheetahboro, and um, LaGuardia. And, and literally, that's in, going to happen in the next 25 years with the level of sea level rise that we're looking at. And there's serious people looking at this and having it anticipated. So regional plan is but it's started by business leaders. It's 150 years old. And you look at any anything progressive that's happening in New York, it was originally that plan that came out of those people. In fact, this is a good place to talk to David Nature. There's a quote from Ezekiel that says, without the vision, the people will perish. And I think this vision of places where every child could have, could be able to walk to a store, walk to school, uh, get some food, that everybody who's out of work would still be able to get on public transit and get to a job. They're, everybody ought to be able to get healthy food. And unless we've got that vision, nothing moves forward. I know that's easy to say, but it's strategic planning and visions are hard work to distill it down to something that it goes, oh, that's just common sense. I've given variants in this talk, and everybody says, oh, what you're talking about is common sense. Yeah, I know. Why have we done it? So, um, actually, I'll stick. I'm ashamed about what I'm going to say next. Um, the secret of advertising 
is to say the same damn thing a hundred times. <laughs> and about the 98th time, people go, oh yeah, that makes sense. But, um, so don't feel bad if you have to repeat the same message when you go to the city council and talk to the mayor. Um, I'm talking to the city of Oakland on Tuesday to the business and the corporate leaders. And, um, frankly, I'm going to give a shorter version of this, but, um, you know, you get Clark's company to decide this is important, or Kaiser, well, they're a pretty good partner, but, you know, getting the corporate leaders to care along with the community really matters. And once people bicycle, it's back to that sick Livia thing. Mm -hmm. My son bicycles to CDC from Decatur, Georgia every day. Wow. And he's figured out routes that he feels safe, gets a workout. He keep, he's in uniform because he's public health service. He keeps a uniform in his office and he changes when he gets there. And they've put showers in to encourage people. It's still a dangerous place. I hate it in some ways, but um, it's his joy because he's got three little kids and that's probably what he needs to do. <clears throat> Dick, when you say something about places like uh, Charleston and Savannah and, and some of those older cities and how they match up to a vision of a livable place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I know people are tired. So Savannah, Oglethorpe laid out the plan for Savannah and it looked like a scrabble board. It's all these squares. And some of the squares were green because that's where they put the parks. And everybody was in three blocks of the parks. If there was a fire and you needed to get across town, it wasn't like modern suburbia where you did all these um, worm-like cul-de-sacs and could end up in a dead end. You actually had 10 different routes you could use to get it out of there. Savannah had an asset by being close to the river and space as well and the beautiful old trees. Um, <coughs> That was a plus. They put in really crappy stuff along the river, including a high up and just destroyed their access to a river. And river access, water access is important. People like being near water. How many of you remember going for a walk in San Francisco along the Embarcadero 25 years ago? It sucked. You know, it was just terrible. And then when they took down the freeway and put in the Esplanade, it, you know, you want to go for a walk. You don't need to yell at your child and say, walk. They, they want to do it. Um, Charleston, Joe Riley was the longest serving mayor in the American history, I think, at least in the country at the time. He was a spectacular, was a spectacular leader. He literally would stand in front of the bulldozer and say, you're not going to take down that building and renovate it. And underneath that is strong leadership, strong leadership, and backbone. And, you know, we've got a strong leader in this country right now, but I'm not sure he's worried <laughs> about my grandchildren very much. But, uh, so, you want a strong, good leader. Yeah. Sir, so tell me about yourself for a what's the, what's the likely impact of all the new emphasis on ADRs, auxiliary dwelling units, in order to try to increase the density of our cities and provide inexpensive housing, theoretically. You know, a fair number of folks... Repeat the question. Um, huh? Repeat the question. Um, there's the thought that if everybody put in a grandma apartment or an in-law apartment or something else, you could fit more people in. It sure sounds like a Band-Aid. Uh, you know, a well-designed building, uh, you can put on a fifth of an acre 20 dwelling units, and they would be quite comfortable. The real secret with affordable housing, in my opinion, what do I know, but I'll ask the architect, but so much of our affordable housing was crappy. That's a scientific word. And by that I mean the walls were too thin, they were noisy, they were not well maintained, they did not have good landscaping, they did not have good sight lines, and they weren't, uh, the stairways weren't kept clean, and people didn't take care of them. And the reason for it was if you put out, and I'll make up a number, you put out a million dollars to build a series of these things, and then you cut the money back by 20% towards the end, all the stuff that are considered, I hate this word, amenities. Mm -hmm. Since when was cleanliness, decent air, and sound insulation an amenity? Those are essentialities. So um, I, I, I actually think we're not going to, they're doing a lot of this kind of building um, in Oakland right now, near the transit stops. There's one. But the problem is the one near MacArthur BART station, mm -hmm. 
So they have four thousand dollars for a two bedroom a month for a two bedroom apartment. They, they, possibly people will move out and vacate their housing, and there'll be some movement. But that's not going to be anywhere near enough. And um, I, I, but I don't think the auxiliary dwelling units are. It's just a short term band aid. It's not going to be enough. But we should. It's a big battle in L.A. because L.A. has voted sixty billion dollars worth of sales tax over the course of 30 years to rebuild the subways and put density near the transit stops. The big battle in LA right now is wealthier people want to live near the transit stops. Because yeah. it's no fun driving. I have a car, but I don't want to drive. I just want to take the subway downtown. So, you know, there's money talks in the US. So it's never, we'll muddle along. Sir. Uh, um, the, one of the issues we have here is what you mentioned it is all second homes or third homes or whatever, and they're vacant all the time. Mm -hmm. So the idea of putting accessory dwelling units isn't all that helpful in this way. I don't know if you've come up with any or you've heard of a good solution to this issue, but, but Carmel, what is that, uh, like 75% that in Pacific Grove have that direction? I, I'm going to maybe dance around your question a little bit because I... We had this awful shooting in Orinda recently in an Airbnb where four or five people were shot because the Airbnbs were being used as, to call it party zones, but yes. there's a lot more than that. I, I think tax policy is going to be very important in this. And we have too many vacant storefronts, for example, and local businesses are good for a community. They watch the street, um, they pay taxes. We need good um, shop keeper citizens in our communities. Half the half of Wilshire, not Wilshire, uh, Westwood Boulevard is vacant. And partly the owners can sit on it forever because they're paying Prop 13 taxes that were established in 1978. We passed Prop 13 to protect grandma from being taxed out of her house and, and yet they're paying next to nothing. And so there are vacant lots, there are dismantled houses which are not being kept up. And so I, I think we're going to have to fiddle with tax policy as a way. By the way, I don't want to tax grandma out of the house, but I do think that the Dell Corporation and some of these big corporations, <coughs> the Decca Records Building, now Capitol Records Building at Hollywood and Vine, pays less in taxes than your grandchildren as newlyweds would pay for a bungalow now because they're still benchmarked to 1978. And that's not right. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to take care of our young people. They're already loaded with student debt and, and, uh, and their incomes are not very good. So I think tax, and I'm not wise, I don't really have to deal with the tax policy issue. But by the way, I think climate is, we're gonna, you know, I'm talking about very deep Republicans are talking about serious carbon taxes. You know, it probably could be $50 a month more in your heating bill. You can figure out a way to take care of it. <coughs> People are smart. You, you give them an economic disincentive, they don't, they stop doing something that is in, in their in economic interest. Here. I thank you all for coming. Yes, thank and you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson.